Hackers up against a wall at DEF CON 25, this time on Hack 5. Hello everyone and welcome to your weekly dose of Technolust. My name is Shannon Morris and today we have some excellent coverage from DEF CON 25. And who are you? Who are you? How does this work? What? I miss this place. Yes, welcome back. This it's got, is like the stickers and everything. I it, know. This it, is the it, studio. It looks just like I left it. <laughs> you haven't been here in ages. Uh -huh. March, I think it was. Five and a half months. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's almost been half a year. The world is good. The world is good. It's nice to be back. <laughs> thanks thanks to for California. checking. Did you check on Alderon? No, you know what? I think um, <laughs> Did I'll you get, get back a good to tan? the Elrond thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we'll see when I can resume that diplomatic mission. But for the okay. time being, I'm just going to have a little layover here yeah. in San Francisco. For a few months or something? Yeah, you know, I'm going to stick around for two weeks before leaving you oh, guys Oh, two again. weeks? Yeah, That's it? Absolutely. Man, seriously? <laughs> no, no, no. Regular episodes are about to resume with the launch of season 20. It will be our 23rd, 23rd. season. I know. It's been a while. Shannon's 10-year anniversary at Hack 5 is coming up. Oh That's my gosh, you're crazy. right. Uh -huh. Yeah, in 2008, yeah. Uh -huh. or I mean 2018. 2008, <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, good times. Well, let's go ahead and get into it with our first interview from DEF CON. So, I am here with Woody, one of my longtime friends, as well as Tim. Hi Tim, how's it going, man? It's good to see you. Nice to meet you too. Woody, it's nice to have you back on the show again. I'm here at DEF CON 25, and these two guys found some really interesting things with a Gotenna. So first off, for everybody out there, what is a Gotenna? So a Gotenna, we have one here. Uh, there's actually newer ones. Uh, all of our stuff was done on the original version of it. The way it's set up, you're at a football game, you have a crisis where there's a flood or there's major storms, and you lose cellular service. Your Bluetooth talks to the antenna, and then the antenna uses the MERS channels to be able to send text so you can now travel miles, even with no cellular service, or even if you have a phone that doesn't touch the cellular network, you use that to be able to send messages to each other or relay and speak to people. Part of it is a non-encrypted protocol, and part of it is an encrypted protocol. Okay. And we started working with that. So all you have to do with the Gotenna, if you have to use it, is turn on your Bluetooth on your phone, Plug it in, I'm assuming you plug it straight into your computer or your phone? Syncs via Bluetooth. However, nothing we did touches the Bluetooth side of it. We were looking strictly at the MERS side because we okay. saw where to find radio is what we were playing with. So what, what were you looking for when you first started messing with the Gotenna? Um, so I was sitting around bored, kind of like when I started doing Iris, and I was like, man, I wonder if I recorded a message from a Gotenna, could I then replay the message and have other Gotennas listen to it and hear it. Like a relay attack or something like that? Uh, well, I would never actually rebroadcast unless I was in a safe zone because it does use MERS, but I'm assuming it works. Okay, I see where we're going with this. Okay, so what did you find when you started messing with the Gotenna? So I called Tim and I go, Tim, I think this, I think you can do some more stuff with Gotenna than we were initially thinking. So he immediately said, well, we need to see ones and zeros. And he came over and we started playing with the, I was using a, um, a Hack RF. Yeah. And he brought his radio over and we started putting things together and looking at the spectrum analyzer. Okay, so what did you see with your spectrum analyzer? Was there anything that really stood out to you? Yeah, the, the first thing we noticed was uh, it started out with, um, we knew the channels because we looked it up on the FCC database. We knew it used uh, 150 megahertz. And so we tuned there and we found out there were five channels that it used. And it was moving back and forth between the channels pretty quickly whenever we sent in messages. And I was thinking, oh no, this is some sort of Bluetooth thing. Uh, but then Woody noticed that it's always hopping on channel four first. And I said, you've only seen like three packets. There's no way you can know that. It's too fast. Wait, hold up. So you noticed that even with just three little packets? Packets are rather small when they're transferring over radio. So how, how did you pick that out so suddenly? Every time you'd hit send, it would always pop there first and then hit the others quickly. And I was like, oh, I wonder if that's, that's got to be a command channel. I bet it's starting there. And Tim sometimes doesn't have, he thinks I'm a unicorn hunter. So, <laughs> What interface were you using to actually view all, all this information? Uh, yeah, Osmocom FFT. Yeah. Osmocom FFT. No programming whatsoever. Yeah, we didn't have to program a single thing to get it up and going. All we had to do was run Osmocom FFT and just look at the waterfall. And we found, I said, I don't know if I believe you yet, Woody. This, I need, I need like to re some repeatability here. I'm a scientific man. So we, what we did is we turned off one of the radios 
And so we figured if it's a control channel, what would happen is the first radio that's starting to talk would say, I'd like to talk to you over here, uh, sort of like a trunk radio system. So then it would go over there and wait for the other person to acknowledge that. And it's sort of like TCP, SYN, ACK, right? So we figured if they, there's no acknowledgement sent, maybe it would try again. And what, that's exactly what we found. It would sit there on channel four, hello, <laughs> is anyone there? <laughs> Where'd you go? <laughs> so how many times did it retry? It was about four times, something like that. Just, just enough to, to get a good effort, but not like at the expense of battery life. Gotcha. Okay. So what did you find when you eventually like, started delving into those? So we, it, we had to do a lot of work to get uh, down to the packet level. We actually had to write uh, a, a custom block that would receive packets and, and turn them into little packets to analyze, because uh, GNU Radio is very stream-oriented. So when we got those little blocks of bytes and data, we started to pull it apart and try and figure out what are they sending, can we see text, and, and for a broadcast, that shouldn't be encrypted, right? Because how else would you receive it? Yeah. So we sent just ABC, and we looked to see if we could find ABC in the packet. Sure enough, it was there, which is, you know, that's expected. It's a broadcast yeah. packet. So as soon as we found that, we knew we had a foothold. Okay, so you tried ABC. Did you try going for like a step further, like ABCD? Did you find anything when you did that? We did. That's how we found where the length was in the packet. We had to know, we've got 50 bytes or so sitting in front of us. Which one tells us how long the packet is? Because we need to know that so that we, my block knows when to stop receiving bits. Okay. So. so what happens if you send an encrypted message over this? Does anything different happen? Well, the length isn't going to go away. The radio still has to know how many bytes it's going to receive, it's pretty common to, to not encrypt the length. Just like when you're receiving a package, you know, there's a to and a from field, and there's a weight to the package. I kind of know how much is inside that package just by feeling it. So one of the pieces that does happen with uh, an encrypted packet is the command channel still tells me what channel all the communications are going to be on. I can still see, see that. I can see who it's going to, and I have the ability to know who it came from. So with that information, we can also tell the size of whatever the payload is. Although encrypted, we can't see what it is. So we can say, you sent this person something, and this is the size of the packet. So, so tell me a little bit about the phone numbers, because you showed me a slide from your talk where you can basically figure out by, uh, by the hex code that you see on there uh, what the phone number might have been. So if you know the OSI stack, there's, there's like six or seven layers in there. And the sixth layer, that's seven, you're right. The, so I don't know it. Uh, the sixth layer is the representation format. And so we were really confused. We saw a, a string of numbers, you know, starting with you know, 9, 1, 2, 4, 5, 3. And, and that's what we saw on the phone. But then we didn't see that in the bytes. And so we were trying to figure out uh, how, do, how do they encode that into the bytes. And we tried all these different things, uh, trying to mash the bits around and figure out where it went. But it turned out it was really simple. If you just typed in the hexadecimal bytes into the calculator and turned them back in the decimal, we would get the packet, uh, the, the, I the Gotenna ID for the transmitter and the receiver. So I feel like that could have some serious implications if you're trying to hide your identity. Um, and I feel like this is, gets a little confusing for a lot of people because encryption well, I would say, like you said, Woody, that encryption does not equal anonymity, right? Absolutely. Uh, one thing we want to clarify with the phone number piece of it is you can use your phone number as your unique identifier for your GoTenna. Okay. But if you do it, just like it releases the name of the GoTenna's ID, the GID, your GID that we catch is actually the phone number for the to and from. But you can change that inside the GoTenna's natural protocol as it is and just use the randomized GID. So we highly recommend people do that. But anonymity versus security, if I'm a celebrity and I have a security detail, I am now safe and secure, but I don't have anonymity. Now, if I'm on the street, the same celebrity, and I hide myself and I make it look like I'm a person you can't recognize, I now have anonymity, but I no longer have security. So the two are not always the same. Right, exactly. So where did you go from this? What was the next step? Well, so the next thing is, well, we found that they weren't encrypting the, the from field. And we sort of you know, tried to understand the protocol. And was it reasonable for them to say, this is the to field, and this is a public information? We feel it's not unreasonable. It, they could go for a more difficult protocol that would encrypt that. But for something that's getting off the ground, it's a hardware startup. They've got battery-powered, embedded software, radios, the FCC, all <laughs> encryption, all of that. We thought it wasn't too unreasonable for them to have the to field. Yeah. 
but the from field, when we saw that never being encrypted, even on private communications, we thought, hey, we could do something kind of fun here and, and start showing people uh, the messages that are being sent without having a Gotenna. You could sit and you could listen to the, everyone talking. So, so it's almost like a man in the middle attack with your computer. It's sort of like that, exactly. We, we're not really messing with the data that's going between people, but we're just passively observing it. So you're doing some reconnaissance, basically. Yeah. That's so cool. So what can people do to protect themselves if they are worried about their information being intercepted? I, one, I do want to state I'm pro Gotenna. I think it's a great policy, especially in areas where if something goes bad, you can communicate. So this is not a dig on them at all. And they do have a new radio that we haven't had a chance to look at and test. But to protect your identity, um, one of the things you want to do is never use your phone number as your unique identifier. And the protocol already designed inside of itself so that you can change that. And the other thing that I would recommend is if you're trying to do things where you don't want people to know that person A is speaking to person B and person B speaks to these five people, what you need to do is you need to change your unique identifier regularly. And we did also find that as you change those unique identifiers, you may want to change them at different times because <laughs> we also found out that it's a time-based sequence that gives you your unique identifier. So oh. if I hit two phones at the same time, they're just milliseconds apart. Everything except the last very section of it is off. And again, I was told that doesn't happen, but unicorns are real. <laughs> more data. <laughs> <laughs> you just need more data. Yes, exactly. That's but it is confirmed now. It is confirmed now. Okay, awesome. I think this is really cool and really interesting. Um, your talk is later this afternoon. I really hope I can go and get away from the vendor booth. If I can't, where can people find more information on your findings and are you going to release the code on this back end? So we're going to release the code five days after DEF CON. Um, we'll release on our Twitter feeds uh, where you can find that. Um, we're doing that because if people are using their phone numbers, we want them to have a chance to change that before everyone has access to this. And that way, it, we just think it's, more, it's going to be safer for everyone. So our Twitter handles, uh, you're able to find. Tim's is uh, <laughs> BJT21304. So it's a mouthful. Mine is TB69RR. So, as some of you know, I have traumatic brain injury, so 6-9 <laughs> is an I, so TB-er. If you can't laugh at yourself, don't laugh at anyone. <laughs> That's perfect. I love it. Thank you both so much. And again, thank you, of course, and thank you for bringing Danan with you. I love checking out the dogs whenever they come to the convention. Is there anything else that's, that we missed that you would like to share with our audience? I just realized that we did this whole thing other than, oh, and by the way, Tim's the person when he says writes things, he writes these amazing blocks. But <laughs> the tools we used for analyzing packets, doing everything else were get it. Oh. They were grep, cut, and sort, and control F using get it. And with that and some basic programs, we were able to do all the packet analysis. So you don't have to have extensive tools to do this. That's awesome. And that's something that happens a lot in the hacker realm of devices is you have these open source software that enable you to do amazing things. And I really appreciate what you guys are doing for the community. I think it's awesome. And if you guys want to find out anything else, we'll put their Twitter handles in the show notes as well as the lower thirds. Thank you guys so much. Oh, harsh. Oh, that was good. Going. It's pretty great. Exhausting in the good way. Are you hungover yet? That was yesterday. <laughs> Me too, right? Yeah. Me too. Got a great idea? Bring it to the web the way we do and head over to Domain.com. They've got a slick domain discovery system and an easy checkout process so your site will be online in no time. And the Domain.com guys have been supporting Hack5 for years and they want to celebrate with a massive promo code. Use HAK Jumbo for 35% off new domain registrations now through November 30th. It's a limited time offer, so when you think domain names, think Domain.com. Hey everybody, I'm here at DEF CON 25 with Anthony. Anthony, how are you doing today? I'm good, how are you? I'm 
Very good. So Anthony is one of my good friends. He's also a Patreon on ThreatWire. So if you want to check it out, it's patreon.com slash ThreatWire. Something we have been talking about on that show a lot lately has been voter registration databases. There was currently a leak from uh, the GOP databases of tons of personal information. And I think this is very important just because like I do online shows. I don't necessarily want my info out there, especially since I've had a real world stalker. So like <laughs> you found something crazy that you can do with that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can take the public information that's uh, put out there by the government, like the voter registration database and uh, you know the county auditor websites and things like that, and uh, you can resolve those into personal information, like the social media profiles, pretty easily. So how do you do this kind of stuff? So I. Uh, for some states, it'll be more difficult because they don't let you download the information. But for the state that I researched, which was Ohio, uh, they, the Secretary of State's website allows you to download the full uh, Ohio registration database. In fact, they, they update it every single week. So it's, it's always up to date. Wait, so you're saying all like addresses, names, what kind of information is in these databases? So it actually has 99 columns as far as I, I saw. I, th I think it was about 99 columns that I counted. Uh, but the main ones are going to be like first name, last name, middle name, date of birth, home address, uh, your party affiliation, things like that. Uh, those are the big ones. Uh, they have your county and zip code and stuff in there too. but uh, you can use that information uh, by itself. It's already pretty nasty because you can you can search for elderly people or young people. You know, uh, who knows what people can do with those? You know, that information. You'd be able to steal steal social security checks or uh, you know maybe or you know if there's predators targeting you know young people. Uh, there's that capability, but uh, unfortunately, that's not the end of it. You're also able to take that information and resolve it. Uh, pretty confidently to like Facebook profiles, uh, which then you can get uh, you know their interests and uh, their sexual orientation and you know their a bunch of other information, pictures and location. So. This is really scary. So, uh, what kind of script did you create for the ability to resolve these as Facebook profiles? So, I built a uh, just a demo application. It started out as a demo application uh, called Alohomora, and I'm releasing it tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I love the name. right. Alohomora. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I'm I'm. It's written in C sharp. It's it's pretty simple. Uh, and I try to comment everything. So, if people want to go in and hack with it, they can. Um, but it's just a tool and it lets you go both ways. It lets you take the voter, if you want to search for 18 year olds on your street or people that voted Republican or whatever and uh, try and resolve their Facebook pages, you can do that. Uh, but you can also uh, go to Facebook inside of the application and search for people that work for my local police department or people that work for nuclear power plants or whatever and uh, import those profiles into the tool and then resolve their home address through the voter database. Uh, you can. It also has a people API plugin, which gets you their email and phone number and relationships and all that stuff, and it builds a nice target profile for you. So why did you build this? Because I feel like this is it's incredibly scary to have that info out there. So why would you make it uh, public? Right. So I was on the fence for a long time about releasing this, um, but I think it's important. And uh, people in the infosec field, we know it's an issue. We know it's a problem, and we tend to not put stuff on the web that would lead us to this issue, but um, the average Joe doesn't know that or they don't care. They think, oh, you know, what's somebody going to do with my, my profile, you know, on Facebook? Or well, one, one example that I've given people is if, if uh, like an agency finds out that you have medical conditions and um, for some reason the ACA didn't exist and uh, you could be denied insurance because you had a pre-existing condition, like you could end up paying thousands of dollars for health care uh, because you were denied insurance strictly because your public information was out there. And that's something that could really hurt a, a crap load of people, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a real danger. And I, I hope that through this um, application that we can maybe get some people interested in changing the laws because that's the real problem. The problem isn't so much that People are putting this information on the web. People are dumb. They're going to do that. It, it happens. Uh, the real problems are, one, Facebook shouldn't be defaulting making all their, pers all their things public. Like, that should be default private, and you should have to opt in to make it public. Uh, if they were just to flip that switch, then 99.9% .9 of this would go away. 
Uh, but the, also the other big problem is that the government database, uh, the, the government shouldn't be releasing databases of information like your traffic violations, which have your first, last, middle, date of birth, and your home address, and your, uh, you know, the voter database, which has all the information. And you know, if I buy a house, or or uh, if I register my uh, license, my dog, like these yeah. things shouldn't be public. And I, I completely agree with you. Laws and I'm, change. yeah, I hope that the laws will change. And honestly, this has happened before, and it's probably going to happen again. If you remember Fire Sheep, um, the the guy that created Fire Sheep, he had the same thing where he wanted to release it. He was on the fence about it. He didn't necessarily know if it was going to go a good way or bad way. But then when he released it, SSL became a better thing. Yeah. You know better things happen in security when you release that information and say, hey, this is a problem, it needs to be fixed immediately. And it is a problem, I completely agree with you, and I'm so glad that you brought this passion forward and that you're making it, um, you're making us aware. You're making us aware that that's an issue. So where can people find more information about you and about what you're doing? Right, so if uh, you want more information about me or if you want to follow my projects, you can uh, follow me on Twitter at .netrussell.com or uh, you can go to my, my tech blog, uh, .netrussell.com. And I believe you're doing a talk, so is that going to be recorded in, on the DEF CON channel? Uh, yeah, so I'm doing a talk in the Recon Village on this and that'll be recorded and put out and my slide deck will be on my GitHub along with all the code for Alohomora that'll be out there as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anthony. Really, really appreciate it. And if you guys want to learn more, you know where to find them. Well, that just about wraps up this week's episode of Hack 5. <laughs> is that what it says? What am I supposed to say again, Shannon? There is no teleprompter. No, there's today. actually no problem. No. We didn't, it says end graphics. We didn't write anything. We're no. just throwing to the content. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let me try it again. I know okay. how to do this. Okay. I've done this before. You got this. All right. <laughs> well, that just about wraps up this week's episode of Hack Five. But before we get going, see you do the you do the poop that was with good. the throw, that right? Was good. I, I liked know this. It. I know this. <laughs> uh, we want to remind you guys that the best way to support Hack Five is to head over to our very own hack shop over at hkshop.com. That is where the gigantic DEF CON booth has now made its way back into its mothership home at the Hack 5 warehouse. Mothership home, it's true. Yes, uh, we've got awesome stuff from that. A lot, uh, we've got sh all of the swag from DEF CON is being printed so that we can have it into the store all the time now. Awesome, like yeah, so look forward to wicked, that. Like these wicked wristy bands. Yes. Yes. Which were actually really cute and worked great as little like hair scrunchies. So, so this, this is what I do. Thanks for making those. This is what I do on the plane You're every so time gangster. I fly. You're so gangster. Every time so I'm like, just this, and, a, <laughs> and a, uh, you need that, and a gin and tonic, and yeah. you're done. That's you're all done. you need? <laughs> and some melatonin. Oh, Yeah, unless yeah. you're going to Australia where it's like a controlled substance. But Which I was not aware of. Whoops. Smuggler. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, make sure to check out hak5.org. That's where you can find all the information about whatever we are up to, our schedules, conventions that we're planning to go to, etc., etc., as well as our social networks, which is also where we post information on what we are up to. And all of the shows. Uh, so you can find mm -hmm. Shannon on Hack Tip and Tech Thing and Threatwire and. Uh, Hack five. Hack five. Sometimes. <laughs> and and uh, talk to Mubix about rebooting Metasploit Minute, get another Ooh, season yay. of that going. So awesome. very excited. So good stuff's in the works. And uh, so, yeah, expect some cool changes here real soon. Definitely. Until then, we hey. want to remind you, as always, trust your technical list. Thank you. I haven't done that in so long. We got the audio too loud on the music out in the warehouse. I'm all Greg. <laughs> is that evil server? Uh huh. Oh no. Evil server is here. Are we staring off? What's He's been. On? Evil server has been watching me record episodes in here since you left. He's been watching, like That's out creepy. of the corner of That's my. Creepy. I know. He's been sitting there the whole mm -hmm. time, and he watches every. Does he have a floppy drive? Um, oh my god, he has a floppy drive. Actually, that would be really useful because somebody gave me a floppy drive at DEF CON. I don't know. We should make sure he's air-gapped. <laughs> yeah, we, he better be air-gapped. I think he's but, you know, I, I wouldn't work too What is he running on? Uh, Celeron. Oh god. What OS? Pure evil. Pure evil. 